My guest today is Arthur Doler. Arthur, how are you? I'm all right. How about you? I'm doing great. Welcome to Code Mesh. Is this is this your first time at Code Mesh? It is. This is my thirteenth time at Code Mesh. <laughs> nice. So if you have any questions, <laughs> somebody told me this morning I, that I'm an old pro, and I'm like, yeah, you're you're half right. <laughs> uh, what are you speaking on? Um, so I'm speaking on mental health in tech. Uh, my talk's called "Owning Your Experience." Owning your experience. What? Th that's. Uh, what does that mean? Owning your experience. Um, so my talk is around your experience in the world, basically. So that we get we put a lot of emphasis on diagnoses and a lot of emphasis on the medical kind of aspect of mental health. Okay. But really, when you're working through the world, when you're just living in the world things that happen to you and your emotions about those things affect your actual cognitive abilities and that affects your experience of the world. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. So that, I talk about it that way to open it up the door because not everybody has a diagnosis or can even afford a diagnosis mm -hmm. this day and age. So we need to talk about it in a broader way. And it also helps to avoid problems because when you start talking in medical terms, you run up with problems with your company, with your you know HIPAA violations or your HR, and it gets uncomfortable. Oh, yes. So, uh, so, so uh, we talk about medical uh, uh, diagnoses. Um, not every mental issue is uh, escalates to the point of a medical diagnosis, right? right. I mean, the, the, I, I wake up some mornings, I'm just not feeling it. Exactly. It's well, a mental issue, but I'm not going to see a doctor about that. Right. So, well, and, and this is this what you're talking about is relevant even to that situation. Right? Exactly. It's, a, it's sort of a continuum, right? Right. And so opening the door to everybody to talk about their right. experiences, their affective, as the psychologists call them, experiences, okay. because those things affect how well we do our jobs. They affect us at work. And okay. Americans are spending a lot of time at work these days. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Yeah. So the good. This is relevant to a broader audience then. Uh, that's the point. I mean, that's partially why I'm trying to talk about uh, it. By broader, I mean everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So tell me some of the issues that we're that you're talking about. Um, so I'm talking about starters, the language that we're using. Uh, mm -hmm. When we talk about mental health, we tend to talk about it in terms of clinical language, right? We use words like depressed. We use words like uh, people talk about. Oh well, I'm all OCD about this thing or that thing. And mm -hmm. while I'm, those are a misuse of those terms in the first place, but. Okay. They also don't really help us because those terms are kind of artificially precise uh, when you start talking about the diagnoses. And they don't mean anything about how you experience them. Hmm. Because somebody who's diagnosed with one particular thing could have a very different experience from somebody else. And as you note, it, some, you could have a similar experience and have no diagnosis. I mean, if you have a spouse or even a pet that dies, that's going to cause like sadness, unless you don't like the pet. But, yeah. Um, I mean, most people really like their pets, so they're going to have a day or two where it's, they're sad about it, and that's going to affect how they right. work. Sure. And so pretending, or even in a, a longer-term sense, that people will have th situations, things that either they plan for or they don't that come up, mm -hmm. and that they know they're not great at or that stress them out for whatever reason because of the way that they've lived through the world. Not planning for those things is pretending that they don't exist, and it in the same way that we try to plan and say as a team, you know, we need to plan for what's in the future, what we're going to do, what's likely to happen. In the same way we plan for vacation days, mm -hmm. we need to be planning for situations to come up where those things are going to happen. Okay. Either, like I said, either we can see them coming up or we don't. But in both cases, we need to be talking about them. Okay. And so, so this isn't just. Uh it's not just about mental illness. This is about uh, people that are d doing fine most of the time, but they have those days. I, I described earlier as I'm just not feeling it that day. It could, but it could be something that uh, a depression or a, or a sadness uh, that was uh, fired off by some bad thing that happened in my yeah. life, or maybe something that didn't happen. Just I'm just well, feeling sad today, and, and I and I and I I'm better prepared for it if I think about that in advance. That's the message you're giving. Yeah, and also to talk about them in in a way that opens it up and says that it's not bad to feel that because yes. we often feel a lot of shame about our emotions sometimes yeah especially uh men in especially western white culture males. yeah, yeah. Yes. um we you know we feel like it's bad to have an emotion that's and our culture has been dr drilling that into me since <laughs> i was a kid so when we have a day when we turn around and say i'm just i can't be here mm -hmm. mentally mm -hmm. or when we have a situation that we can't deal with for whatever reason then we end up feeling worse about ourselves because we can't deal with that thing instead of talking to somebody and saying look i i can't do this we feel like we have to be 
the super people that just go, hey, like power through anything and when we can't because mm -hmm. that's unrealistic in the extreme right. then we feel worse about ourselves right. and that can actually lead to diagnosable right. clinical problems like and that yeah so this the talk is kind of to normalize some of those expressions to talk about the things that come up like our fear of having those conversations okay. our fear or shame over those things um, another one that comes up is the thing that I call facile optimism um, which What's is that? A, I know, it's a fun term. Uh -huh. um, it's fun to say. Facile optimism. Yeah. It, it, facile just means like overly naive, basically. Okay. Um, Usually, I think it means easy in French. Yeah. So, well, and yeah, the English connotation is kind of the overly naive, right. simplistic. So this is basically us going, hey, oh, yeah, this thing is happening, but it's not really affecting me. It's a way that we try and diminish how much something's affecting us so we can feel like we can retain control over the situation and give us feel like we have control over our lives. It's sometimes, very sometimes it's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, that uh, I can set aside my own angst and my own anxiety and, and get the job done. And that's that can be a good thing, right? It can be a good thing. And I'm not saying anybody shouldn't. I'm more saying we need to open the door for people to say, I can't. Okay. That if they want to step up and, ch you know, grow and change, I'm all for that. Right. And... But we can't enable those situations without first hitting the realization of right now, I can't. Okay. And I want to, and mm -hmm. I need to grow. But if we do that internally without discussing it with anybody else, then we're trying to do it without any support. Mm. We're shutting ourselves off from our coworkers helping us, our family helping us, our friends helping us. Is that is that what you mean by uh, planning for this, is uh, talking about it and finding that support? Exactly. Whether you're doing that in the moment which is hard, or trying to do it beforehand, mm -hmm. saying, oh, I think this could happen, or looking back and saying, what are the situations in my past that I'm traditionally very bad at handling or that caused me a lot of stress or anxiety or depression, mm -hmm. identifying those and saying, all right, what should I do when those start coming back around? So you're recommending uh, uh, some kind of self-analysis to figure out what what I'm I'm good at and what I'm potentially not good at or what you know what's going to cause me to not be good at something. Yeah. And there's also, you want to think about it in terms of what your, um, other people can see how we're feeling way better than we can. I've had personal moments where I've been in depressive states for months mm. and I did not notice. Oh. I mean, very much that fast. I bet, I bet your friends did. Exactly. And it took months like for them to come around and be like, okay, Something, what's happened? Like, something's, something's wrong. wrong. That's the kind of thing I want people to start having that conversation up front faster. Okay. Because... Why should, I mean, it, I don't, it sounds selfish when I say it like that. Why should I have to suffer through depression? But why should they have to suffer through me being depressed for three months and yeah, not being yeah. good at my job and just getting frustrated at me not doing what I am because I'm not realizing the state that I'm in. Right. That's, I'm not blaming myself in that moment. I'm not blaming my coworkers. Mm -hmm. But if we enable those discussions and open the door to having them, that gives a chance for the coworkers to say, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Can we help? Okay. And that can help. How did you ultimately resolve this? Um, I had people come up and talk to me about it, and I sat down and looked at what was, had been happening. I'm like, oh, crap, they're right. Mm -hmm. um, started changing situation. Like, first off, even just acknowledging, yeah, sometimes we, we, we do want that control, right? We feel like we want control of our lives. But sometimes oh, yeah. it that's, can, that's actually my, my <laughs> se Dave's secret to happiness is feeling, is believing that my actions will control the outcome of my life. Which it's, they may or not be true, but if I believe it, I'm going to be a happier guy. It's true. <laughs> Except for some instances where it's, there are programs like the 12-step program. I don't know if you're familiar with like AA, for, a, et cetera, I, I, right? Yeah. Uh, and a number yeah. of other things. But Dogs Anonymous. one of the things that's important in that program, and I'm not necessarily explicitly endorsing it, is acknowledgement of what they call a higher power. Okay. Whether that's religious, whether that's something spiritual or not. Something beyond your control. Exactly. There is a psychological benefit to acknowledging that there is a moment of, I don't control this. Okay. And it... it you're correct in that in the day to day, we kind of want that level of control over yeah. our lives. But acknowledging this thing is beyond me right mm -hmm. now can be helpful in us not feeling like we're to blame for that thing. Oh, okay, I see. And that can be help us power through those moments. So when I look at it, I said, okay, here's where I'm at. I'm not to blame for this depression. Something is going on in my life. And it let me kick in a couple other coping strategies, mechanisms that I needed to put into place, should have put into place way oh, earlier. Can you share some of those? Um, 
No. No. Uh, that's no. That's fine. No. That's it's a personal question. There are different ones. I mean, they're all very personal for people. Like, yeah. there are ones of... Uh, like I have some friends who uh, have been diagnosed with seasonal affective disorder, which is a, or they call it SAD, which is a very stupid acronym. But um, uh, what is seasonal affective disorder? So it's a effect a disorder where people uh, in the in the winter start experiencing depression as the okay. sunlight diminishes. And there, I mean, they don't. There are a number of theories, like a lot of mental health stuff. There's a lot of theories that we have, but no provable tests on mm. most things. That like you can't go get a blood test and or take an EEG or whatever and get to diagnosed with depression. Okay. Like, so it's theories about they, what's they look actually at behavior and then right. the, uh, extrapolate from that. So in those cases, my friends go, okay, I need to be doing things like getting a lamp, like a uh, lamp that produces UV light, oh, okay. like the sun, like the specific sun wavelength, because mm-hmm. that supposedly helps actually help some of them and it doesn't help others. Sure. Um, making sure that you set up plans beforehand so you don't isolate yourself. Yeah, I was in Scandinavia. <laughs> in December, Whew. and and they have like uh, clinics there. Not clinics. But they have like there's a business around. It's <laughs> just like UV the sun. Wow. Yeah. Uh, because the sun sets at three o'clock right. in the afternoon. Yeah, I was in uh, Norway in the summer, which uh, I was there. Le- I saw you there. Not this past summer, but the summer before. And that was uh, the that was crazy because it's like three in the morning. <laughs> the sun's out. Yeah. Like, what is happening? <laughs> but that I mean, in the same way. Finding your own coping mechanisms for, okay, if I know I'm in a depressive state, I need to go find something that is happy for me, something that diminishes the amount of stress I'm under so that I can kind of recover and recuperate. That's a process that people have to know and figure out on their own. We can't do that without people um, acknowledging where they're at and cutting themselves off from support in those moments by feeling, well, I should be able to do this. I should be able to handle this all on my own Mm. is unrealistic and harmful because then it people want to help each other That's by and true. large yeah and, and most of us don't know how exactly when everybody's sitting there watching me suffer in a depressive state and they don't know what to do that's a helpless feeling and then they're feeling bad because now i'm not measuring up to what i should be mm-hmm. and then i feel bad because i'm not measuring up to what i should be and everybody feels terrible about it and nobody knows what to do like sure. but if we sat down and actually had the conversation up front about like hey this is going on or if i'm can if i can see it coming sometimes like like i said with my friends with seasonal affective disorder they know around october they need to start prepping for it interesting so acknowledgement of that recognition of that of what's going on is probably I, i've heard you say this several times that's that's step one yeah uh yeah my father actually suffered from something that uh, i had never heard of it was called sundowning do you know this term um and this is uh, something similar to what you just described but it's when the sun sets his mental capacity diminished he became hmm. uh uh, my mom described it as paranoid, which is, I know, a medical term, but uh, he became suspicious of things around him. He became depressed. And I totally get that. I, I feel something similar to that myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but he, and he was, uh, it was a distinct difference between daytime and nighttime. So That's fascinating. It, it sounds similar to the, 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 the winter versus summer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I think SAD thing you talked about. That's where it's maybe, it, in acknowledging that those things aren't necessarily in our control, right. that gives us the space to go, okay, I can't necessarily control that, but I can plan for it. I can yeah. prepare for it. Yeah. And that gives us that control back. And that helped my mother to prepare when she was caring for him at the end of his life. That yeah. She knew it's getting later in the evening. She needed to kind of brace herself for some irrational behavior by him. It helped. I, I want to talk. This show is really about technology. We haven't talked about <laughs> technology at all. And that's okay. But the, the reason you're on it is because I, I know you through the technology community. Do you, do you think that the, these issues are different for folks in tech than they are for just people of the society at large? Um, I do, actually. I feel like, well, for starters, tech has some unique pressures that other things don't. Anybody in that digital creative space has that pressure of the instant, really, in that technology digital technology is, is instantly changeable by and large. Um, and that means that, un- like, un- what, do you, what do you mean instantly changeable? Well, think like back in the day if you were doing, like if you were a graphic designer uh, back in 1950, you're doing drafts on boards, on yep. paper, right? If somebody said, I need this thing to change, you knew, they knew that you had to go back and do a change and dra- redraw the thing yeah. or do an erase. Expectations were that it'd be days or maybe weeks before exactly. that change would be but delivered. Now it's instant. Why can't you make that code change immediately? Why can't you change this? Like, you just have to select fill and then redraw the different color. Like, if I want that jello green instead of orange. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, 
there is some unique pressures kind of coming from that digital uh, space okay. that other, and it's not, I'm not absolutely saying that software or digital creative stuff is harder than anything else. I'm just saying there's a unique piece of pressure to it. Okay. Um, but above and beyond that, I feel like that computers have a unique space for people who are, I guess what they call neurodivergent, which means that they think differently than other people. Okay. Computers can be a comfort in that moment of, think about it this way. If humans are unpredictable, strange, weird, one is different from another. Sure. By and large, one computer is the same as every other computer. Right. Unless you're going from Mac to Windows or whatever. <laughs> but no. No, he, no, but a, he, but a program should run the same every single time and have a... Right. Computers do exactly... Output, exactly given, what, given all the inputs are the same. Yeah. People it, are not like that. Exactly. Computers do exactly what you tell them to. Mm. And if you know the magic language to tell them how to do it, yeah. then they do it. That's a very comforting space. Again, to one of my pet theories is people who have not had a lot of control in their lives gravitate toward computers. Because mm. computers offer that control. Okay. And to your theory earlier about wanting that control over our lives because that yeah. makes us happy. That control can be gotten through computers. If you've had bad family life, if you were, I mean, the, the stereotypical example is the, you know, the kid who was bullied in middle school, right? Mm -hmm. The nerd and goes and, like, I'm going to go learn computers. a robot to beat up his friends. Well, or <laughs> just goes and learns a language because that's a power he has that yes, they yes, don't, yes. right? Yeah. Correct. And that, so there are a bunch of conflate, like, well, and... Nobody has done a really good study on developers, on software developers and mental health yet. Um, mm -hmm. There have been a couple ones internationally in the recent years. Uh, there was a lightning talk about that last night, actually, which was nice. By you? No, it wasn't. Um, it was I by heard you gave a lightning talk. I did not. Oh, oh, it wasn't you. No, okay. somebody else giving a lightning talk about mental I, health. I, yeah, go to continue then. No, I mean, this I, I, I assume I heard that. I just assumed it was you. <laughs> <laughs> I am flattered. Um, so he was talking about there's a couple different studies about this, but one was 96 and one in Japan and one was 2000s in India. Uh -huh. There's basically nothing else. Interesting. The only other thing we've got is uh, the Open Sourcing Mental Illness nonprofit, which I, I guess, volunteer oh, okay. for. So I'm oh, literally okay. wearing the hoodie right now. Um, they do an annual survey for developers, which is an, I mean, it's the problem with survey data, right? It's opt in, it's uh, anecdotal, it's not necessarily a good sample size or sample set. You can't, so you yeah, can't. so it's not scientific. Yeah, right. But it's the best we've got right now. Okay. The results from those surveys indicate that there is a distinct difference, increase in the number of people in mental health who have a, or excuse me, in tech who have a mental health challenge. Oh, really? There's more uh, mentally ill people in tech than there are in the population at large? That That's what we've got so far. Uh, anecdotally. Okay. Right. Um, and again, for a various number of reasons, I mm -hmm. believe that, but... It's we have no idea how to grapple with it, and we have no factual basis on a on a, cert, on a you know peer-reviewed study level to prove it. Okay, but we're so we're, so we're still at the early phases. We're recognizing the issues, and uh, next step is to figure out how to resolve those issues. Right, and so I'm trying to get an end run around it, and just go just to a point where we're talking about trying to address their issues without necessarily having firm proof of diagnosis. Because uh -huh. if we can start talking about it without those terms, mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter. If you have, I mean, it matters. I'm not saying it doesn't matter if you have a diagnosis or not, but in, in the context of the discussion, then it doesn't matter if you have a diagnosis or not, because we can still plan and deal with, like, not deal with, but talk about and engage your personal experience at work, regardless of if you have the diagnosis or not. So. Very good. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think we should have? TypeScript? TypeScript on this topic. We can do another show later on on that. Um, Are you a TypeScript guy? Right now, yeah. I'm a fan. I've Yeah. TypeScript gave me back my strategy pattern, and I love it because I <laughs> used to be a Java developer, and I was like, yes, interfaces, finally. No. Um, I basically, like, the thing that I keep trying to tell people and the thing that's important is that it's not, you should not be ashamed of who okay. you are. You absolutely should not be ashamed of you and the way that you experience the world because that's you and nobody gets to tell you that's wrong yeah. good advice arthur thanks so much thank you what i recommend everybody do is go to your friends in technology go to the people you know and start talking about this in ways that you feel safe. Find friends that you can support each other because that kind of mutual support, that peer support, is essential to surviving in any kind of world.